Well, I'll tell you, that was really, really great uh, uh, last week. If, uh, if you weren't here to, uh, uh, to hear it in person, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to listen to it on the app. And if you don't have the app, I would encourage you to get the app. And, uh, uh, you know, it only makes sense. Let me just say it this way. It only makes sense for you to hear what's available here if you're going to be here. I mean, why, why would you be here? and not want to hear what you could hear here. Y'all hear? <laughs> but honestly, I, and I'm sure this particular, this particular group of believers, I'm sure I don't have to, uh, I have to belabor anything like that, but uh, you know, a lot of people do, do church for the strangest reasons. Honestly, they do it for the strangest reasons. And... Uh, uh, really, you should have only one reason, and that's to uh, uh, plant yourself in a place where you can hear the truth, where you can constantly be challenged and stretched, where you can uh, devote some energy and resources to the advancement of the kingdom uh, so that you can grow and be the child of God that he wants you to be, honestly. There, there aren't any other reasons, really, that... Uh, uh, that are the least bit valid. I mean, uh, I guess if the weather's real bad, you could say, you know, just getting out of the weather. But you know, life can be really bad regardless of how, how the weather is. And that's what the Word of God is designed to do, to make your life great, regardless of the season or regardless of the situation. So as we continue to look at humility and honor, and again, I'm thinking about the... Uh, uh, about the, uh, uh, the the sinkholes, and uh, I think about it. I think about it in light of what we've talked about the last couple of weeks on Sunday about uh, about your words, how uh, your words are uh, are a dynamic that uh, uh, that can create a uh, uh, a really soft place to live on, and uh, and before long you see your life crumble. You know, oftentimes there are people that everything looks good on the surface. Everything looks good on the surface. And I'm not, I'm not talking about mean people or ugly people. I'm just talking about people. I'm talking about people who they, they do well, everything looks well, but yet because they know some things in the Word of God that they're, that they're not honoring, they are setting themselves up for, uh, for a potential fall. And... Really, what triggers that is pride. Anytime you know to do and don't, that's not only sin, that's pride. That is pride. When you know to do and don't do it, that's sin. Now, let me tell you something else. If you're told to do something where you work and you don't do it, that's sin. That's sin. If everything you know to do, you don't do as unto the Lord, then that's sin. That's not doing right. Huh? That's not doing right. So once we become the children of God and we hear the truth, we're responsible for the truth. The Bible declares it to those it's given as much required. When you know what's right and you don't do it, huh, that's wrong. And there's no way to justify it. However, people will do everything they can to justify it. Won't we? Haven't we? Yes, we have. But we don't need to continue like that, praise God. Because when we allow humility to swallow that nonsense up, then we find out how much better our life can be. Forsaking you for him is forsaking death for life. Really, you need to, you need to spend enough time by yourself uh, Embracing a statement like this, um, 
in order to keep yourself focused in the right direction. Because the more you continue to embrace you, your plans, your ideas, your agenda, the things you want, the way you want to do things, the longer it's going to be before you have the kind of life he wants for you. Because he is the one, the only one that's capable of directing you, protecting you, provide, providing affection for you, hmm? and, and producing through you. He's the only one that's capable of doing that. So this is one of those things. This is statement is one of those statements where, where you just have to kind of, you, you kind of have to reprogram how you see uh, who you are, where you are, and what you have. You have to come to the point where no matter how good you're doing, you realize, I don't want this to be on me. I want to rely on him. I want it to be he that directs me. I want it to be he that, uh, that I can always count on. Because I don't care how confident you are in your abilities and what you're able to do, uh, you can come to the end of your rope and uh, he never will. He always has an answer for every situation and, and it's never difficult. He always has an answer. When something happens that you weren't expecting, he was not caught off guard. He knows exactly what to do. He's the only one that has the peace to get you through it. Your husband doesn't, your wife doesn't, your children don't. He's the only one. Even when you were mistreated, he's the only one. He's the only one. He's the only one that's got a salve, that's got a bomb, if you will, for that hurt. He's the only one. He's the only one that can set you free from things that you should have never had to endure. He's the only one. He's the only one that can make things that weren't okay, okay. He doesn't make them okay, but he makes you okay. Amen. Because he's all about you. He's all about you. But you have to forsake you for him, just like you would have to forsake death for life. Because that's exactly how critical it is. When he told the people of Israel through Moses that he set before them life and death, blessing and cursing, and his decision for them and his desire for them was to choose life, then that's exactly why. Because there really is no gray area. You're, you're either living his life or, or you're not. <laughs> I had something real cute to say there, but it was, it was not right. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, you know, a little bit of life that's not his ain't life. Hmm? It's, a, it's a little bit of having to put up with something or compromise or huh? set yourself up for a fall. In Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, these verses we obviously can use a lot uh, uh, when it comes to our giving, and, and they can certainly be used that way, but uh, I've got a statement after this that I want you to see. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. And all the drinkers said, yeah, that sounds great. This was a promise from the Father to the people of Israel. And we really have the same promise. We would look at it a little bit differently and receive it a little bit differently. But it's all about, it's all about knowing where your stuff came from. It's all about knowing where your stuff came from. When you know where your stuff came from, then you don't, you don't, uh, you don't mind uh, uh, honoring the one who, who set you up. Amen? And he's the one that set the people of Israel up, and he's the one that set his family up. He set us up with covenant and promises that are even better than the people of Israel had. Now, we can share in what, what filtered through the cross uh, from even the people of Israel, but we've also got things in this new covenant that the people of Israel never had. 
Hallelujah. How about an opportunity at Revelation and opportunities to walk in power that many of them never did? How about the fact that the only ones that could hear the, hear the Spirit of God uh, personally was the prophets, the priests, and the kings? But in this life, every believer should be filled with the Spirit and should have an insatiable desire to hear from Him and receive revelation concerning what they hear here and what they hear when they study and do the things that they should be doing on their own time. Don't give me that nonsense. You don't have enough time. Please, don't give me that. That is foolish. That is foolish to say you do not have enough time. No, it's imperative that you take time to get closer to him so that as time winds down, you'll stay in a great position. Amen. Because there will be some that don't. There will be some that don't. Don't wait till you need him huh? to try and make a vital connection. I mean, that would be good if it worked, but it won't work. It will not work. That's just not the law of sowing and reaping. That is not the law that God portrays that's called the law of love. The law of love does what it can where it is so it can grow into a position where it can do more, where it can handle more. Amen. Honoring God begins with honoring Him with you. You are the substance that God wants the most. You. 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 Your spirit, soul, and body, your heart, your mind, your will, your emotions, your physical presence, that's honestly the substance that he wants. He wants you. He wants me. He paid to have us. But he's not a slave master. He's not a bad boss. He's a loving father. But does it sound ugly for a loving father to want his kids? I mean, the Bible... Jesus said, even you being evil know to, how to give your children good things. How much more will your heavenly Father give you what he has for you? I mean, would, would it be weird if I wanted my children to be blessed like crazy? Hmm? Would you think I was weird? Hmm, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. Well, you know, if me not, not being in the same sphere with our Father God want my children to be blessed and to be connected to that blessing, how much more do you think the Father wants us connected to Him? You know, again, the more I think about how blessed we are living in this nation, the more I realize what it is, how it is a curse for most people. Well, that got a lot of praise. <laughs> because you become lethargic. You become lazy, apathetic. You become insensitive to the things of God. Every need and every situation, even, even the times that you're uh, in trouble and behind the eight ball, there's always a way out in our country. There's always a way out in our country. But you know, in some places, you better know God. You better know God. You better trust God. And you know what? There's a lot of people in a lot of third world countries that know him better than people right here in Hobbs, New Mexico. Yeah. People that should know him the best because really we're in a pretty comfortable position to learn 
and to grow. Really, not much pressure whatsoever. And even if there were any, Jesus said in John 17, 33, he'd already overcome it for us. You know, just knowing that should make us realize our Father always, always has a plan of escape for each and every one of us. But honoring God begins with honoring Him with you. Your possessions will follow. Your possessions will follow. So because you are a picture of what you possess. Everything you do and everything you have. And what you do with everything you have is a picture of who possesses you. Is it the Father or is it you? Because He wants you. And He doesn't want you so you can't have. Honestly, He wants you so you can have more. But until you turn yourself over to Him, guess what? You'll never know that. You'll never know that. Many of you, you just sit back and be critical. Well, you know, he's just saying that. No, that's what the Word of God says. Hmm? The Bible says when we turn our back on the things of this world, and that is from a uh, loving less perspective than we love him, then he puts us in a position for even greater rewards. Jesus told his disciples that, and he's telling us that as his disciples. So honoring God begins with honoring him with you. Your possessions will follow. You know, that's like, uh, you know, that's like a, person, a person that's not born again. What, what does God want? He wants you. He, he paid for you to have access to him. He wants you. I mean, I mean, what else would we have to offer him? Hmm? There, there's got to be more to his desire than uh, the resource you can generate and you being able to bless the kingdom. Listen, uh, that's not what God's ever been looking for. He's always been looking for a people. He's always been looking for a person, an individual, who would receive what he had done for them. And it takes, a, it takes a, you know, a special event in every individual's life for that to happen. But you know what? It can happen anytime. Anytime a person realizes, anytime a person is willing to humble themselves and say, you know, uh, they're just willing to say, you know, self, you're, you're not doing good. Something's wrong. I believe what I'm hearing is what I need. I believe I need someone who loves me more than I love me. And they're willing to do for me what's obvious that I can't do for me. You have to come to the end of you. You have to come to the end of you and take hold of him. Glory to God. That's why he wants you. It all begins with that. In Romans 12, 1, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, or beg you, by all the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul's telling them, these are believers. He said, I'm begging you, by all the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice sacrifice. Uh, you've heard me talk about it before when, when I hear people talking about, you know, what they're doing and they're spending a lot of time and they really feel like they're sacrificing. And I just, you know, don't do that in my presence. Okay. Don't do that because it's, you know, it's one thing to not be very smart and it's another thing to start talking and let everybody know it. There was a final sacrifice And everything from there on for his kids is an honor. It's an honor. I said it's an honor to do what he's asked us to do. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, which none of us in our finite minds can even come close to comprehending. 
so that we could have the freedom to honor him. To honor him to the very best of our puny ability. Huh? The very best of our weak, miserable, out of touch ability. We can honor him. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now what happens when an individual does that is he co-labors with us to make everything we aren't sufficient to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. We don't do it on our own. We can't make it on our own. The street version, I said this verse this way. I'm begging you, brothers and sisters, to connect with God. Be pure in your motives. That's the least you can do considering what he's done for you. If you've got just a little bit of a revelation of what he's done for you, you know, at the moment each of us make that decision to receive Jesus as our, as our Savior and as our Lord, because each one of us is unique, we, we can't really uh, articulate that, 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 that event to other people. It's, it's so personal because you're personal to him. Your, your new birth experience is absolutely unique because you're unique. Hallelujah. So you can't, you can't even, you can't even uh, explain that to people. That's why people, you know, there are people you'll ask them, say, are you, are you, uh, are you a born-again Christian? And, and they'll say, well, I don't know what that is. And then, and then you can say, well, you're not then. Or they'll, they'll tag people like us as, as uh, evangelicals or people who, uh, uh, who promote uh, being born again. Well, there's no other kind of Christian. Now, I don't know what the, what the tag is you got on your, on your life or on your building or whatever you do. But if you're not born again, then you're not a Christian. I said, if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. So now, if, if you've got any question about that, we can take care of it after a bit here, but if you've got any question about it and you need to visit with some people that may not be born again either, then you ought to question it and ask them. Because Jesus said you must be born again. Now, if Jesus carries any credence in your house of worship, then, then you ought to go by that if you don't go by anything. And when you have an understanding of what he did for you, which according to the word of God has took you out of darkness and brought you into light, huh? Then, then, then this, shouldn't be, this shouldn't be a problem to understand that we, we have made an exchange. Hmm? We've made the great exchange, hallelujah. We have, we have, now, we have now identified with his substitution. What we were, we no longer are. Amen. And because we're no longer who we were, then there's a different assignment for each and every one of us. And that's why he's saying, I'm, I'm begging you by all the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You have pure motives. You're serious about this transfer that's taken place. You, you've considered uh, the way it was and now the way it is. And see, if you are born again, there is a difference. You know there's a difference. It doesn't mean that the moment you're born again, all of a sudden you feel clean all over more than anywhere else or, uh, or, or all perfect or anything. But something happens on the inside. You know, there's a touch from heaven. There's a replacement of your dead spirit with a new recreated spirit that puts you in perfect harmony with God from a spiritual perspective. And then that's why Paul's telling the believers here, I'm begging you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You've presented yourself, you've presented your spirit man for him to renew and to make brand new. Now present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. 
which is the least you can do. Amen. Amen. Just your reasonable service. I mean, listen, honestly. Now, because, because when we think about somebody being bought, we think about them being enslaved. Isn't that right? I mean, if I buy you, then I own you. And I can tell you what to do and when to do it. Isn't that right? Isn't that what happens? Isn't that what, isn't that what happens in slave settings? That's not what happens when the father buys you. He gives himself the right, if you'll let him, do his thing in your life. But from the moment you become his child, you still have to continue to choose the depth of that relationship that you have with him. And he'll never twist your arm. He'll never try and get your attention through anything heinous. He'll never whip you or beat you or he'll never have anybody do it for him because he loves you. Listen, somebody ought to give God a little bit of credit for just dying for us. You ought to give him a little credit for dying for us. You know, the next time you're tempted to get into one of those conversations with people that are blaming God, you ought to just say, now, are we talking about the God that died for us? Now, what sense does that make? What sense does that make that he died for us, now he's going to whip up on us? Makes no sense at all. Even to somebody that's slow. And we can't use some words anymore. Even somebody that's really slow. And let me tell you something about people that are really slow. I mean, really slow. I mean, they're really slow. They've got a spirit. That if they're, a pro, if they're, if they're uh, exposed to the word of God, that spirit man knows. Hallelujah. Don't you know that God's got a way for everyone? The fastest and the slowest. None have to be lost. Because God's bigger. God's got a plan for everyone. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Does that make him in control? No, that makes him so full of love and so, so unwilling that any should perish that he makes a way even for the slowest. Amen. So we present ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. We were bought with a price. We were, so the next time somebody says something, that was good. The next time somebody says something about, you know, about, well, God, uh, you know, God this and God that. I, I, so you're talking about the God that died for us? I mean, that's so goofy to think that, huh? And do you know that, man, I don't know how it works, but, and it doesn't make any difference, but I just know according to the Word of God that, uh, uh, that obviously they're together, yet they're separate. You know, I had a minister ask me once, he said, well, you know, how, how could... Uh, how could, how, could Jesus, how could Jesus go to hell? Uh, that would have meant God went to hell. I said, well, I'll tell you how he did that. He's God. He's God. Is there, is there somewhere in here you can just go ahead and say, well, you know, since I'm walking by faith, I really don't, I don't know exactly how that worked, but sure enough did. I sure did. And we know he went to hell. How could you be made new spiritually if he didn't die spiritually? No, he died. My God, my Father, why have you forsaken me? There was a parting of the ways so that Jesus could pay for us so that we could be united with him. Amen. He paid the price. And now all he's asking us to do is to honor him enough to give him an opportunity to show us what else he can do for us. Because he's not trying to jerk you around. He, you're not some sort of a puppet. He's not trying to make you look bad in front of your friends and your relatives, make you look like some wimpy Christian or whatever. No, he's trying to make you more than a conqueror. He's trying to make you realize that no matter what battles come along, he's already won them. He's already won them.
no matter how big the Goliaths, no, no matter how big the situations, when you've presented yourself to him, he will be your victory. Amen.